Hi, my name is David McMaster, and I'm the pastor at Chetwin Fellowship Baptist Church in Chetwin, BC, and it's a, an honor and a privilege to be able to share the Word of God with you today. I want to talk to you today about silence and solitude, which is one of the many of, of the spiritual practices that is found in the Christian faith. Here's a question for you. When was the last time that you were in intentional silence and solitude? To be honest, I think many of us avoid silence and solitude. Um, we live in a very busy world and it seems almost counterintuitive and unnatural and even uncomfortable to be in silence. We are, we are bombarded with noise all the time. In the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we are so afraid of silence and solitude that we chase ourselves from one event to the next in order to not have to spend a moment alone with ourselves in silence and in solitude. And that's not hard to do in our world today. But wherever you're starting today, whether this is something you fear, something that you've, you've never experienced, or something that is, is a regular part of your spiritual life, my hope today is just to offer you some reasons why silence and solitude is such an important spiritual practice for the Christian faith. You know that Jesus practiced silence and solitude? He prioritized it in his life and his, in, in his ministry. Let me give you a few passages to see this. At the beginning of his ministry, right after he was baptized, Matthew 4, 1 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus had started his ministry by going 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness in silence and in solitude. It was one of the very first things he did. Matthew 14, 23 says, After dismissing the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Well into the night, he was there alone. So after a long day of ministry, he would engage in solitude. He would withdraw to go and spend some time even participating in some other spiritual practices with silence and solitude. Luke 5.16, yet he often withdrew to deserted places and play, prayed. Mark 1.35, very early in the morning while it was still dark, he got up and went out and made his way to a deserted place. And there he was praying. Jesus prioritized silence and solitude in his life and in his ministry. And therefore, as Christians, we should also prioritize that in our lives as we seek to be apprentices of Jesus. So let me define solitude for you. Solitude is being alone to commune with God. Solitude is being alone to commune with God. Now, one thing is worth stressing is that solitude is not loneliness. Loneliness is the absence of anyone. It's total isolation, and that's what many of us fear the most when we think about solitude, is, is being the presence of nobody. But that's not what, what uh, solitude is. Solitude is temporarily withdrawing from noise and from other humans so that we can specifically and intentionally be with God. It's not loneliness, it's being alone to be with God. Now let's define silence. Silence is an intentional act of listening and focusing and being fully present before the Lord. So, so hear this, silence and solitude are not an end in themselves. They are a means to focus on God and create an environment where we can experience His grace. So with that in mind, let me give you nine spiritual purposes for practicing silence and solitude. Because it's important that we know why we're intentionally going into silence and solitude. This is not an exhaustive list, but it's a good place to start. Some of these are my own. Some of these I'm taking from a great book by Donald Whitney called, who wrote a book called Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. First is that silence and solitude minimizes distraction so that we can focus on God. We already discussed the fact that we live in a very busy uh, world where there's, there's countless ways for you to be um, filled with noise and distraction. And when we're consumed with noise and distractions, it can be difficult to think and to focus on God, at least for me it is. And silence and solitude provides an environment where you can focus on God without distractions and without noise. So if you find that you cannot focus on God, take a look at your environment. Is it chaotic? Is it noisy? Is it busy? Try going to a quiet place for the purpose of focusing on God. Second is that silence and solitude can be for the purpose of worship. Worship to God can be expressed in many different ways. It can be expressed through your obedience to Christ. It can be expressed through the praise of your voices. It can be expressed through actions, but it can also be expressed through silence. 
This is an interesting one. Scripture has a few verses that show this happening. Habakkuk 2.20 says this, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let the whole earth be silent in his presence. Zephaniah 1.7, Be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. Indeed, the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. Zechariah 2.13, Let all humanity be silent before the Lord, for from his holy dwelling he has roused himself. So worship can be expressed in silence. And sometimes that's the most appropriate response. Sometimes there's just no words to truly express the deep love and adoration and thankfulness that you have towards especially what God has done for you. And God is so infinitely holy and, and, and good and majestic and compassionate and gracious and yet we're so far from that. We're rebels who have sinned against Him and we don't deserve any mercy from God. And yet He loved us so much that He sent Jesus to die on the cross to take our sins upon Himself, to suffer the punishment of our sins on our behalf so that we could be forgiven and restored and reconciled with God through the grace that's offered through Jesus Christ. There are times when the reality of the gospel hits so deeply that our, our affections are so moved by the holiness of God that silent adoration, silent reflection, silent praise is the most fitting and appropriate form of worship in that moment. Third, is that silence and solitude can be a place of testing your faith. First verse I read earlier was Matthew 4, 1. It said, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I was thinking about this one. Uh, just because you're in silence and solitude doesn't mean that you're escaping the temptation of the enemy. Jesus went into solitude for 40 days, and, and guess who was there? Satan was. Satan was armed and ready for battle. And he intended to do what he could to try and have Jesus fail, which of course, he's the one that failed. Now, of course, we know that Jesus defeated Satan, but the point I'm making is that if Jesus want, went into solitude and was met by the enemy, don't be surprised if that happens to you. Solitude is not a neutral zone. The, the enemy may be full well on attack. And he may allow that to happen. God may allow that to happen to test your faith. So don't be surprised if, if the enemy tries to do that, but keep your faith and your focus on God. Fight the enemy with God's word, which is what Jesus did, and pray for God's help. The enemy will flee as he did with Jesus. Fourth, silence and solitude can be for the purpose of restoration. After a busy day engaged in ministry to others, Jesus said to his disciples in Mark 6.31, come away by yourselves to a remote place and rest for a while. Ministry and people can take a lot out of you. Ministry can be physically and spiritually demanding. Rest is important if you want to sustain any sort of long-term um, ability to do what God is calling you to do. Jesus is saying that solitude and silence can be a practical way to just spiritually and physically rest and recharge your body and your mind and your soul. Fifth, the purpose for silence and solitude is a spiritual perspective. There's a point in my life where I went to a time of of silence and solitude, uh, along with some fasting and praying for, for two days, to have some sort of spiritual perspective on what was going on in my life during that time. Now, instead of God telling me why things were happening the way that they were, God gave me a new spiritual perspective during that time of silence and solitude with Him. And through fasting and Bible reading and prayer, He pointed me to focus on His character. The more I focused on his character, the more joy and peace came to my soul. And, and as that happened, I got a greater view and understanding of who God is, which gave me greater confidence that my problems were, were quite insignificant compared to how big and powerful God is. And all that came out of a time of silence and solitude. So if you try to find yourself looking for a spiritual perspective, try prolonged and intentional silence and solitude with God. Sixth purpose for silence and solitude is to seek God's will. This is similar to the previous point, but, but a little bit more specific. There are great examples of Jesus seeking God's will in silence and solitude when he was on earth. Let me give you an example. Luke 6, 12 to 13 says, During those days he went out to the mountain to pray and spent all night in prayer to God. When daytime came, he summoned his disciples and he chose 12 of them whom he also named apostles. When Jesus went to chose who he was going to call his, his 12 disciples to to follow him, he spent a night in silence and solitude and prayer, which led him to the twelve that chose to follow him. If you're seeking God's will, a great place to start is by seeking it through silence and solitude. Seventh purpose is to teach us to control our tongue. Donald Whitney, 
his writings, he included this in his list, and he points out that the Bible speaks a lot about controlling the tongue as being important to Christ-likeness. And, and scripture does speak to this. If anyone thinks he's religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. James 1.19 says, my, my dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Ecclesiastes 3.7 says, There is a time to be silent and a time to speak. In other words, silence and solitude can be a great place to practice not talking. Simply listening to God. It teaches us how to listen. When we practice silence and solitude, the byproduct is the training of our ta- and taming of our tongue which according to James is part of our spiritual growth. Eighth purpose is to practice other disciplines. The, the passage that we started off with showed that Jesus was going into a time of silence and solitude to pray. And when he went to the wilderness, he recorded fasting as part of this time. This practice can create a, a, a spiritual environment to practice worship and prayer and fasting and meditation and, and journaling and resting and Bible reading and learning and, and so on. There's lots of different things you can incorporate to this environment that you've created through silence and solitude. Now, the last little bit of our time, let's just talk about how to get started practicing silence and solitude. First, you've got to know your purpose. I've just listed uh, eight purposes you, you got to know why you're doing what you're doing. It's, it's not um, an end in itself. This is, this is to create an environment to be with God. So know your purpose for why you're going into silence and solitude. Second, you need to carve out time. Jesus had a very busy ministry schedule. And often uh, he, had to make a, he still made a priority to make silence and solitude as part of his life. And and often for Jesus, it was early in the morning or late at night at the long day of ministry. But Jesus found the time, meaning we can also find the time in the midst of our busy schedules. Third, is find those special places. Where you go matters. Go to a place without distraction, without a ton of noise, without people around you. Maybe it's sitting on your back deck with a great cup of coffee early in the morning. Maybe it's in your room um, behind a closed door where you can just spend a few moments away without distraction. Maybe it's late at night when everyone's gone to bed. Maybe it's in your commute on your, in your car on your way to work. For Jesus, he went to desolate places. He went up to a mountain often to pray and to be in silence and solitude. So find that place that works for you. And so if you've never tried this practice, Try it. Embrace the, the awkwardness if it's something that you've, you've never done before. Lean into the fear if it's something that you fear. And I would encourage you to incorporate this as part of your life and, and see what God does. Let me close by praying for you. Father, I thank you that you are present with us when we come to you in silence and solitude. Father, thank you that it's a, it's a special place that we can go and we can focus on you. I pray that you would help us to find time this week to incorporate this spiritual practice into our own spiritual lives. I ask this all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.